All right, the last and probably short session is the cash tiering here. Uh, so is Alan still around? Alan? Yes. And yes, I'm here. And Jikang and from Intel. And who else? I think you two are it. You two groups are it. Uh, I think Narendra was supposed to be here. And then Sage and Mark had a, had a blueprint also. Um, Mark asked me to fill in for them. Okay, fine. Um, uh, hey, Patrick, uh, Shishir and Chaitanya are also here. Are you? Great. Awesome. Yeah, I'm trying to browse my way through four blueprints really quick. But Oh, you're right. You were on the same blueprint as Alan, though. So you, the whole sand disk. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sam, you want to kick yours off first? I think yours fell top to bottom. Uh, you were the first one. Then. Uh, yes. And then what was next? It was yours, then the Intel one, then the SanDisk one. So we'll run through them in that order, uh, and then we can beat each other up on cash tiering as we go along. So dive right in, Sam, by proxy. Can you hear me now? There you awesome. go. Okay. All right, let's see. So the... Hang on. Right, okay. So what... Uh, Sage and Mark had was an experiment where they tried, rather than always promoting in the case where the uh, hit set showed that they should, they set it to promote only n percent of the time. In this case, something like one one percent. Uh, my understanding is that this pretty much allows them to measure the cash miss cost associated with um, reading directly from the cash tier, or from the base tier rather or reading proxy from the base tier. And what they found was that, for replicated pools at least, on random reads, the performance was actually pretty good in that case because it turns out that a lot of the poor performance we were seeing was because of extraneous uh, promotions uh, eating up all of the cash tier throughput, possible that it was Um so this suggests two things. One, that the uh, cash miss overhead is actually not super bad, as long as we're not having to do a promote synchronously before we perform the read. Um, this also suggests that when we get the uh, write proxying merged, we should hopefully get a similar improvement on writes. So, right, which suggests that what we really want to do is focus on when we want to do uh, promotes. So what they're suggesting is an is uh, remembering more explicitly the most recent operations, devoting some memory to remembering the most recent n operations, so that we can uh, focus our efforts on promoting objects that really have been accessed a lot of times recently. The hit sets have limited granularity since their main purpose is to uh, detect cold objects, but they don't do a great uh, great, great a uh, they don't do a great job at differentiating among the hotness of hot objects. So they suggest we add a queue, uh, an MRU queue, and trigger async promotions from the head of that list. Um, we basically want to throttle the number of promotions such that we're devoting a certain percentage of the cache tier's write throughput to promoting from the cold tier. So um, it occurred to me that one way we could do this is we could tune the promotion or not promotion threshold based on how many promotions we've done recently. So if we've used a lot of IO recently on promotions, we could become more selective and vice versa. Um, the goal being that we do want to mod we, we, we do want to let the current cash tier set move with the hot set of a distribution, but we don't want to randomly chase actual random I.O. because we won't uh, get any more benefit that way. Um, one thing that, uh, another thing that came through is that with this uh, approach, sequential I.O. from the erasure coded tier, or if you have an erasure coded tier as a base tier, was much, much worse, which is not terribly surprising since 
a lot of reads had to go through the PC base tier before we were willing to promote it. So that further suggests that even in that case, we want to be very we we want to do a good job of detecting uh, obviously uh, sequential I/O. All right, I think I covered all the points Mark mentioned. Questions? Now it seems fairly straightforward. Yep. Um, I, I I think the the biggest takeaway is that the proxy reads really did have an enormous uh, effect. So that's good. Seems relatively easy. Uh, I guess the next one we were on to was the uh, the Intel blueprint. So Zhang, probably butchering that name too. I apologize. You had a blueprint on improving uh, improvement on the cache tier eviction. Uh, yeah. Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yep. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, some times ago, uh, we did some testing uh, on the cache tiering using the FIO DPF distributions. Uh, we have the um, we have um, we have four mega uh, four hundred gigabyte data of the total total. Data size is 400 gigabyte, and uh, when you uh, from the DPF, uh, DPF um, FIO have a tool to estimate uh, how many how many data will be hot uh, using a tool uh, called the Gen DPF, and uh, from this tool we use the uh, parameter 1.2, then we can get a 90 percent over over 90 percent of the data will be hit um, in no, no, no. Sorry, over ten, ten uh, percent of the data will be hit, will be hit over eight percent of the time. So from this point of view, I if we have the cache size uh, setting to because our um, data size is four hundred meg gigabyte. So if we set the cache size to be uh, to be forty forty gigabyte, then we will have a good performance from the cache sharing. And uh, in our testing, we said that we said the cache size cache size to be a I think maybe it's uh, we said to 80, 80 gigabyte. That is uh, larger than forty. And we expect that we have a good performance. But from the result, uh, it is much lower than than our expectations. So uh, this leads us to believe that the eviction algorithm is not perform, perform doesn't perform so well and, uh, and then we we want to um, propose something to uh, to improve this okay in the current implementations of the uh, eviction uh, there are some there are something not that good I, I we in the current implementations, we uh, we we do the eviction based on the age of the object. That is, uh, uh, we have heat set to cover the. Um, we, we have several heat set for each PG to cover the uh, the time of uh, of the object age. Uh, for those objects which is which is in the heat set, uh, we we use the heat uh, the heat set heat set timestamp to calculate the object age but there is problem with this since we uh, since he said we'll cover a lot of objects uh, then all of the objects in this heat set will be get the same get the same time I mean the same age yeah the same age and then uh, when we use this age to calculate the uh, to calculate which one should be evict then I, we didn't get get a good result from this because I we have many objects in the heat, in the same heat set, then we have the same age, and then we have the same I, 
uh, this uh, this object will be evicted at the same time. I mean, and for those objects which are not in the heat set, I currently we use the m time to to uh, use the m time as the age. I but uh, as we as we know that the m time is the is a is a multiple time. It is it doesn't change uh, when we doing read or or some or we doing read operations on this object. We do not change the m time. I so uh, this means that uh, I, the read op operations doesn't have uh, doesn't have effect on the on edge of the object access. So both of these are saying that the the age the, the age calculated from the current implementations is not that accurate. Mm. And also, uh, when we when we want to when we doing an evictions, uh, we uh, we calculate something like that. Now we we use the. Uh, a power of two histogram to to uh, to locate the object age. We can get an upper bound and a lower bound, and then we compare the upper bound with the something called evict effort to decide we, uh, if we should do evict this object. And uh, uh, this evict effort is uh, is a global value to a, a PG. I so uh, from these calculations. Uh, maybe some some object which may be accessed later than than some other object, but the, the, the earlier object of uh, the later object may be evicted before the earlier object. I don't think this this is quite reasonable. I think this, both of the, uh, all of this lead to the to the not that good performance of the cache theory. Okay, based on this, I I have some thought, although it's not it's not a clear idea yet. I just want to bring up some ideas so that we can have an earlier discussions and then we can we can get more from here. The first one is uh, to to calculate the uh, the to to improve the way to calculate the age. Uh, okay. Let's uh, when we say the age, we we uh, actually we are using the recency to to we have some, some we have a word called recency. We use the uh, the age is something some something called recency, and then we use the recency to to make the decisions. Uh, as we as I said before, uh, the recency is not that accurate using the m time or using the he said. Uh, the first idea is to uh, maybe we can keep track of the a time. Maybe the a time is the excess time. Then um, it is updated both for read and write. Uh, but keep this in memory. It seems like uh, it's not uh, it's uh, it's it's not it's not good to keep it in memory because it maybe we need a lot of memory to keep keeping that in for. But uh, Persisting it with together with the object info is also not good because uh, when we do a read, we do not uh, uh, when we do uh, when we do read operations, we, we are not going to persist in anything to the to the disk. And so maybe maybe persisting the a time into the um, into the Key value store is a, maybe it's a good idea. If we have this a time, then we can use this a time to calculate the age that is the recency of the object, and then we can make more accurate decisions to evict the object. The second idea is to um, is called something is something called the reuse distance. Uh, the reuse the reuse distance is something. Uh, define as the uh, we we access an object and then later we we access some other object and uh, after some time we access the first object again uh, we call the reuse distance as the the number of accesses between these two 
access of the object. A, we, uh, the, there is an ag algorithm called LIIS. This algorithm is um, proposed some, some years ago, and they used the reuse distance to, to, uh, to make the, make the paid, actually they are doing the paid replacement policy investigations. And then we can, we can also use this idea to, in our cache replacement. Uh, the idea for this is that uh, we have uh, many hit set. We have we can set the, hit, the number of hit set for PG, and then we we uh, each each PG uh, each hit set covers uh, some time, or it covers a, a number of objects. And uh, if we have a uh, enough hit set, then uh, we can calculate the reuse distance like this. Uh, say we have a hit set one, and hit, we have six hit set, and the object is accessed in the hit set one and hit set six. Then uh, it, hit set one, hit set, hit set six has all have the timestamp. Then we can get the reuse distance of this object access as the timestamp of the access one, uh, hit set one, and the timestamp of the of the hit set six. The the uh, we can, the difference is the, the reuse distance. And for those uh, objects which are not in the, in the hit set, uh, if we can, if we can find the ones, if, if we can find the object once in the, in all of the hit set, that means that the reuse distance of this object is infinite. If we can, if we can't find it in any of the hit set, we, it is infinite also. So for, uh, we can make this to calculate the reuse distance, and then we can also use the power of two histogram to make the eviction, de eviction decision. OK, if, if we also have the airtime, uh, we can also uh, calculate the reuse distance based on the airtime. The third idea is to use the the LRU list as we as all of the people doing in their systems. I I, I there are some of the uh, some of the LRU list which are uh, in practical use. One is called ARC. That is this one is uh, is used in the IBM high end storage system. And there are some others called uh, some such as LIRS, and they're also used in some um, in some systems. I think we can also make use of these these algorithms to make a better eviction decision. Uh, in the Linux kernel, they also used some they also used a tool list to track the the information and then make the eviction decision. I think we we can also employ that to do the same thing. But the problem is that if we use the RU and we need to keep all of the information in the memory, that uh, that would be, let's say, uh, yeah, that need to consume some of the memory. But I think that memory is affordable for us. Uh, let's say for if we have a uh, one one thousand gigabyte cache, and then each object is four megabyte, and then we have uh, we have uh, yeah we have two hundred fifty thousand this number of objects and for this number of objects we uh, if we have a yeah you cache for each object if if we, if we have a yeah you cache yeah you list to hold all of the object and uh, let's assume the the size of uh, for each object is is about um, 40 40 bytes then the total size would be 10 megabytes that is uh, for 1,000 gigabyte cache, 
we need to use another 10 megabytes for the ARU list. Yeah, and then uh, and this uh, this 10 megabyte can be spread into several OSDs that depend on how many OSDs do we have. Yeah, I, so I think this one is affordable too, but it's a little complicated than the two the first two ideas. Any questions on this? Uh, do you have a good feel for how much of the problem is caused by poor handling of the information that's there? You talked about using uh, uh, A-time, maybe having deeper hit sets with the different distance, versus how much of the problem is being caused by uh, individual bits in the hit set, uh, essentially uh, merging the behavior of multiple objects because of the resolution. Mm. For the first two ideas, I think uh, it's it would be not that complicated. The the overhead would be not that too much. Uh, for each operations, uh, let's say for the airtime, I uh, we need to uh, for each operations we need to update the airtime. For right. Uh, this is okay since we need to to write to to persistent uh, the object info to HDDs and uh, uh, a lot of the, we put if we put the airtime into key value stores, um, I don't think that is too much overhead. Well, that's for a right. read. Yeah, for read. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. For read, we we need to uh, yeah. For read, we need to. Uh, there is some latency overhead. We need to persist the the airtime into key value store. Mm. That depends on that because this information is 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 much smaller. I think the time is is affordable. It's doable. to turn every read into a write? Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not actually turning read to write into write. I would just maybe make, make it sync. I think we still keep the read as the sync operations, and then we just add a, a sync operations to write the airtime into key value store, into runs DB or level DB. Sure, OK. Um, so if it's part of the actual object metadata, we need to write it to all of the replicas, which means a write. Um, it's yeah. true we can choose to buffer an, an unstable a time and write them out later. But right. for that yeah. to be consistent, we would need to issue an actual rep up. So that would be difficult to uh, batch. Another uh, another approach would be to write them to a, a write aside a time buffer, maybe of the most recent. And written objects, uh, mm -hmm. but I wonder if that's really different from using something like an LRU variant. Or I, I briefly started reading the LIRS paper, whatever that is, uh -huh. um, combined with a hit count and an A time, and periodically snapshot that object to all of the replicas. I'm skeptical about the value of keeping it only in memory because I worry about after an interval change uh, having drastically different cache behavior, which would be bad. So it would be nice if, period if at least periodically we were able to snapshot our current cache and uh, our current um, recency information. I don't think I we need to like the... record eight times explicitly, though. If we just periodically snapshot out the information, that would be better. Uh, snapshot what information? With either the LRU or reuse distance approach, there would be some form of in-memory uh, cache okay. or, uh, sorry, cache information. Yes. So periodically, we just could snapshot the, the current state of that information out to all of the replicas. Maybe a, a just like the he said, right? Hmm? Just like what, so what we did with the heat set snapshot. 
Yeah, snapshot right. The, it, yeah, that's okay. that's mm -hmm. that's exactly right. So it would be analogous to an A time, but we would make no effort whatsoever to keep it actually recent. Mm -hmm. Just not massively out of date. Mm. Okay. But yeah, I, I think something like this is necessary. And you're right, we can keep thousands of objects, or a, a thousands of object long list in in memory for at the cost of only a few tens of megabytes, mm -hmm. which really isn't that bad. More if we reduce the H object yeah. to some form of hash, a much longer one than the 32-bit one we currently use. Yeah, I think the AI variants can make the, the the accurate decisions, so I would prefer this one. Yeah. We've had some patches floating around that try to use the object context cache for this, which I'm pretty strongly against. I would vastly prefer this uh, uh, approach. Object contexts mm -hmm. are big and expensive. These would be small and cheap. Yeah. By the way, uh, I, I read some some something from the web uh, the internet that uh, I see Linux kernel is also you, they have some they already have some LU list they have uh, they have two list one to hold the uh, uh, hold those pages which are accessed once recently and the another list to hold uh, to hold those pages which are accessed more than twice recently and. Uh, they, they still have some ideas to improve, improve this uh, this ARU list. Uh, they're also considering using the algorithm I. I uh, they also use the algorithms like the LIS and also ARC. Yeah. So I, I, so I, I will. Think... I will point mm -hmm. out that the Linux kernel is often optimizing for workloads we'll never see because they were already absorbed one layer up in a Linux kernel page cache. Um, mm -hmm. So I would I would favor keeping as simple as we can. Although if there's a, an obvious demonstrable benefit to one of these, then we should do that. Yeah, okay, yeah. We can, we can go from the simplest first. Yep. I'm just pointing out that some of some of the complexity in the page cache is because they they specifically need to be very fast at specific things that happen in servers and workstations that we will never see. And that they have a lot of complexity mm -hmm. to deal with specifically those those cases. So if we also will deal with workloads like that, then it would make sense to copy them. But not otherwise. <laughs> yeah. All right, was that everything for that one? Yeah. Okay. Then the uh, the final blueprint up for this evening uh, slash afternoon uh, is the uh, the SanDisk blueprint. Alan, you and Shishir, and I forget who the third name on your blueprint was. You guys want to take it away? Sure. Shishir, you want to do it? <clears throat> sure, Alan. Uh, can everyone see the slides? Uh, not yet. <clears throat> yeah, not yet. Okay, uh, looks like I'm not able to share the slides, but I'll just uh, you know begin with it. Uh, so, so basically, what 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 we are trying to do is enhance the cache uh, tiering uh, to support user-defined policies, uh, which the primary consumer would be RGW and objects. Uh, the primary goal would be to support eviction and promotion scheduling uh, for objects. 
uh, and also support creation of objects to bypass cache tiers if required. Uh, this would coexist with uh, Yehuda's uh, RGW bucket expiration uh, work that he's proposed in the previous uh, blueprints. Uh, the, the, what we would be basically coming up with is a new policy engine which ties uh, all these together. Okay. Uh, the policy engine is what would uh, manage the rules. Uh, the policy engine, the, the RGW would talk to the policy engine and uh, figure out what is the policy to be enforced. And these policies would be set on the objects through <coughs> exactors. Uh, and uh, we basically we would call them stamping or tagging with uh, policies. Uh, you could also uh, come up with different loadable uh, policies through RADOS classes. We would have uh, support for that too. But the default policy engine that we would come up with should be sufficient to support most of the workloads. Um, any, any questions, please, please feel free to uh, interrupt me. Uh, the, the work in the tiering agent would be to understand these new XNN attributes of objects, uh, to make sure that the tiering agent uh, would be configurable to uh, invoke a crawl on the cache tier to uh, parse all the objects which require uh, these rules to be enforced on. Uh, also, the tiering agent would uh, be enhanced to evict an uh, object to not just the base tier, but to uh, named tiers. So in case there's much more than one layer of uh, tiering, you, and if the user would want uh, eviction to not the base tier, but uh, the nth tier, we would uh, support that to identifying either the pools by names or through uh, the pool IDs. In the future, promotion of objects should also be uh, possible uh, for the simple reason that there might be workloads where you would need certain objects to be present in the cache tier to improve the performance. So we, we would try to tackle that too in the uh, next installments. Uh, the rules basically would be set for objects, buckets, pools, and a global one. Uh, the object, uh, if, if you want to specify a particular rule for an object, it would be through HTTP headers in RGW when you do a put. Uh, if, if the uh, headers are basically not specified uh, with uh, rules, then the uh, rules set on a bucket or a pool or a global in this hierarchy would uh, come into effect and, we were, and the policy engine would tag or stamp the objects. Yeah. Now, the, again, identified by names or IDs, and if the lookup of a particular pool or a ID uh, fails, then currently we would uh, resort to resort to erroring out the request. In the future, you could also define a default pool to which uh, object would go to in case uh, the pool name is not specified. Right. Uh, we would identify uh, rules based on pools. Say something like uh, you know pool name followed by uh, read and the duration, which would say what's the maximum duration uh, object can leave in uh, leave in that pool uh, based on uh, read. Once the duration uh, uh, times out, and during the next crawl cycle of the tiering agent, you would actually evict it, and you would evict it to a named pool, which would say something like pool read and evict pool. Uh, similarly, we would uh, have uh, uh, rules for write duration, write evict pool, creation, uh, so on and so forth. And, and this would be a much more exhaustive list, which we will share uh, as and when we uh, you know, get more in-depth uh, idea of uh, the different rules that we want to support. Uh, so, so, so th that's that's kind of what we are proposing, where where we would give the user a much more fine-grained control of uh, either making sure that the objects exist in the cache layer for a certain particular duration, and after that you would move it to a particular pool or you know even mark it for deferred deletion. Uh, that that's our overall idea. Yeah. Any any questions, suggestions? Alan, you want to add something to this? No, I think you did a pretty good job of explaining that. Uh, you know, uh, the the goal is to uh, let people, uh, you know, administratively control where the objects go. I think the two principal 
things that people would want to do would be to send a subset of their objects uh, directly to the base tier, skipping a cache tier. You know, you could see that being done for uh, large objects or objects with certain uh, uh, file name patterns um, that was in the proposal. Uh, the other thing would be to uh, administratively expire objects out of the tier. Um, you know, people would be able to say, well, okay, I want this data to be around for 30 days, and then after that, you can just banish it. Sam, Josh, thoughts? I tried to say makes sense, but I was uh, muted. Uh, so, makes sense. Seems like it's fairly straightforward, not terribly complicated. They'll, the only thing that seems really uh, is the directly writing to the base tier. Um, and with the proxy write stuff, it seems like we might be able to reuse that. That's how it'll work. It doesn't... We, we we don't want to directly write to the base tier from the client because it makes the consistency part hard. Um, but the proxy write's almost as good. Yeah, no, I mean, directly write, I think proxy write is the way to deal with that. Right. I don't mind so, yeah, that's exactly how we how we do it. The part during the process of deciding where to redirect it, we would consult a policy here. Right. Pool level policy based on the object name, I suppose. Or based on the metadata in the OSD op. It'd be yeah, the metadata in the uh, in the object. The uh, naming stuff would be handled by the on ramps like uh, RGW. Well, annoyingly, that means we need to inspect the OSD op to find out what the metadata is going to be. But that's that's doable. Well, yeah, we probably yeah, that's a little annoying. It, it, it's not that annoying. It's entirely doable. It's just a tedious detail. Right. Could probably well. There are obviously ways to make that e less tedious. Probably not worth worrying. Well, for about. one thing, we could um, instead of making it a well-known X header, we could make it an explicit Rados operation that will make it really easy to pull out of the OSD op. Right. We'd still store it as an X header, of course, but it would be stored in the OSD's private namespace and not in the public. Right. Client visible one. That would probably be a better way to implement that. Yeah, I can see it both ways. Yeah. All right, does that wrap it up for us, does it? I think there was some questions about the interaction with the bucket expiration stuff that was going on. Really oh, saw. yeah. So, well, that's that's another thing. I would like it if this stuff were also uh, queryable during scrub, because it may be that we want to trigger other operations as, as, as well. Although, come to think of it, I guess. So object uh, expiration, it seems to me, would be a, 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 a scrub level concept rather than a uh, cashier, a cash sharing process, but only because you might well do object expiration on a pool that does not have a base tier, and therefore no, no cash sharing agent scanning in the background. But that's not a big divergence. It's just a matter of making Scrub aware of the... Uh, is the... the is having... As, as well. Is having the so is the object expiration going to update the uh, bucket index? Is that going to cause a problem for the crawler? Actually, I haven't talked to him about how he plans to do it. Uh, I hadn't thought about that. Um, either it must happen. Perhaps he intends the object expiration to cause a callback out into an external service like Redis GW. That's one operate uh, one option. Um, yeah. Another option is the OSD itself could trigger a, an operation which updates the bucket index on the way out. That's possible. Yeah, we, did, we did the caching, the, we did the tiering stuff carefully to avoid that problem. It should be yeah. executable totally locally without having to interact with any of the other uh, 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 PGs, etc. Right. 
Yeah, I'm not sure how he plans to do that. I'll have to ask him. There's no reason in principle why the OSD couldn't simply uh, remove it from the 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 PG could initiate an asynchronous operation which the OSD does on its behalf that simply runs whatever RadioCW would normally do. That is a RadioCW class operation that's capable of making object recalls. I don't think there's an inherent problem with having the uh, OSD daemon do that. No, I agree. Not 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 from the scrubber. You should be able to to do that. And, you know. Well, in, in this specific case, because Radius GW already has all of the machinery it needs to deal with the OSD failing partway through, because right. clients can be fail part partway through. But in this case, you don't need any of that because the cache tiering system already has the relevant uh, primitives for promoting and evicting. Right. Uh, demoting to different pools is going to be a little bit more challenging. We'll have to think about that. Well, we tried to plan the tiering machinery to allow that to be specified without getting into the weeds yeah. of uh, the, the mechanisms. The, the plan would be, the assumption would be that whatever, when that comes into existence, the mechanisms will exist, and it's just uh, applying right. more policy. Then, yeah, that. That part is, is certainly true. Sam, what about the uh, idea of promoting from the base here? Uh, currently, there is. I'm sorry, I can't quite hear you. Um, Chaitanya, I don't think we can hear you. If the volume is know? low. It's like correct, it's just low. If you can tweak up the gain on your mic. Uh, I think I'm, I'm. Can you hear me now? Yes. Better, but it would be better to do some more. <laughs> um, uh, can I just talk? Uh, yeah, you can hear me now, right? Yeah. 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 So the question is uh, we were proposing something like based here pushes back data into the cache tier at some point of time. That's, that's one policy. But currently, there is no mechanism where um, the base pool writes data back to the cache pool, right? It's always a pull from the cache, cache tier. Uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, we, right. so, that's easy enough to get around. Uh, so um, you're right. None of, none of that exists yet. It's not really a, a blocker that the base tier or that the cache tier uh, is always pulls. It's just a matter of we we set up a an operation where the base tier notifies the cache tier that it wants to pull this this object, and the cache tier does it. Um, the other piece that part would be done in Scrub, I think, unless it needed to happen on some. Actually, I can't think of any reason to scan a pool without scrubbing. So I think you just scrub more often. But agreed. I always envisioned this to be synonymous with the scrubbing agent. There's no point not to be. Yeah, I was trying to think of the because you wouldn't want a deep scrub necessarily, but the shallow scrub part. There's no reason not to check the metadata while you're there. Yeah, exactly. And oh yes, know. there is because checking the metadata involves talking to the replicas. That's why uh, the cache tier, the tiering agent is separate from scrub. Uh, which is not to say that you wouldn't necessarily also want to scrub, but it means that if, if you're just trying to apply uh, policy decisions to the objects, you don't need to talk to the replicas. You can just have the primary scan. So with a 3x replica pool, you do one third the work. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I could see that going either way. We could we could either create a shallower scrub that runs more often and doesn't talk to the replicas and just does trivial metadata checks and also applies the policy engine. Or we could create another engine not unlike the cache sharing agent. Or just run the cache sharing agent. Might be easier. You know, I think the tiering, the expectation was is that it might be only done, say, mm -hmm. once a day or something like that. So yeah. Doing a shallow scrub at the same time, at least for initial implementation, doesn't seem unreasonable. 
Yeah, I'm thinking about the other direction though. It's always kind of bugged me that the tiering agent is a separate process from from scrub. If we mm -hmm. re if we rephrased the tiering agent as a very shallow scrub, then we would accomplish both goals. But yeah, both are reasonable. Oh, yeah, okay, there are a few other differences. Scrub goes to some effort to uh, ensure consistency of the result, so it locks the extent of objects that it's scrubbing at any particular point, which you definitely don't want to do for a tiering agent, or for a policy agent, come to think of it. So that's that. That's an argument for not using Scrub. Okay. Yeah, I, I think the, the eyes have it. Well, hmm. we'll see how it shakes out. All right. Seems like sounds a like good... we're done. Yeah, it sounds right. like a fair bit of quiet there. So excellent. Um, did you guys want to run through Narendra's blueprint at all? Is there anyone here that would like to represent that? chat through the cache tiering uh, efficiency of read miss operations or should we just let him uh, catch up with Sage on the back end? I mean this looks like a description of proxy reads which we already merged. Oh. Like right, well, so, I say I someone let him effect. know. <laughs> cool. All right well it sounds like we can just uh, beat him up uh, offline somewhere or on the lists or whatever. All right. Or rather, this is an alternate thing you could do instead of proxy reads, but proxy reads gotcha. faster. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess that concludes it. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for another great uh, Ceph Developer Summit. Um, obviously, we'll continue these discussions on the lists and uh, in IRC. Um, and then, obviously, tickets and pull requests as normal. So uh, if you have any questions... Uh, about the summit let me know otherwise the videos should be posted sometime next week uh, and we will uh, look forward to seeing you for the uh, k release summit in a few months thanks everybody have a good afternoon and or evening <laughs>